Amen. Hallelujah this morning. Give him some more praise today. I believe as exciting, as exciting as it is to sing Hail or High Water, I get just as excited singing blessing over the next generation. Amen. You can be seated if you'd like this morning. We're excited to be in the house of the Lord and we welcome you again uh, this morning. For those of you in the house and to our life Changers Online family, we welcome you this morning as well. We're excited to be here, to be there, wherever you are. I know Ohio's here and Texas is here, and I'm not sure who else right at the moment's here, but uh, we have a great following outside of this building, and we are privileged, honestly. We are blessed with an online family that loves us and uh, supports us in prayer and in tithes and whatever else they're doing out there, and so we're very excited about it. Uh, most of you know I got a new iPad. Uh, it wasn't by choice. If you follow us at all on Facebook, I happened to leave mine on the bumper of my Jeep, and uh, it didn't fare too well. Uh, but I do know what the inside of one looks like now. I never did before. And so uh, if that, you want to see what the inside of one looks like, I can help you out with that. Uh, and so you can bear with me today while I figure this out. But I'm excited to be here. I know God has been speaking a word to us, and uh, we've talked about spiritual amnesia. We've talked about different things, and God has just been preparing us, I truly believe. And you may say, well, you've said that for a couple of weeks. You know what? I'll keep saying it, right? Uh, because I, I believe that we need to repeat it until it's repeatedly done, right? And so when we get our mind set right, our heart set right, then I believe God is going to move miraculously like we've never seen before. Today, the title of my message is, We Need a Made-Up Mind. I think that we can dilly-dally around. I don't know if that's a word. It is now. Uh, new word for your tautology list. And so uh, I believe that we need to quit dilly-dallying around. I believe we need to get serious about God. I believe we need to quit riding the fence because, as I told someone this past week, they were talking about, I need to get off the fence. I said, you do, because Satan owns the fence. Uh, I believe that we need to get a mindset of who we are and whose we are and quit being tossed to and fro every time the wind blows, every time you hear a different report on the news, every time you hear something different uh, uh, from one of your friends that you hold wherever you hold them. It is foolish the things that we see in society right now. It is an abomination, the things we see in society right now. And so instead of riding the fence on every issue, how about we just get in the Word of God, do what God said do, act like God said act, preach what God said preach, live like God said live, amen? And so I believe that the, when Jesus comes back for his bride, when the groom comes back for his bride, he don't want a bride that their mind's not made up. Would you want a bride that, you're, that their mind's not made up? That they stop four times coming down the aisle deciding if they're in or if they're out. I wonder if that's what God sees. It, it, it burdens me, just to be quite honest with you, here of late because I see that as much or more than I see the ones that are ready to run down the aisle. And we see people that are just playing the fence. We're playing the role. We use every excuse not to be in the house of God. Why? Because our mind is not made up. When your mind is not made up, you are vulnerable to the enemy. When your mind is not made up, according to the word of God, then you're not only vulnerable to him, but to the many lies that he's going to feed you. And that's where offense comes in. That's how you begin to get that spirit of offense. And it is a spirit. That's why when we talk about offense and when we uh, get bold about offense, we ask him to open the doors that the spirit of offense has to leave this building. It's a spirit. And if you find yourself always being offended, you need to get on your face before God and repent and ask him to cleanse you, to give you a right mind, and in turn, you'll receive a right heart. And so when we look at that, I believe that there are too many people in the world today that are double-minded. They haven't made up their mind. And as much as that concerns me, what concerns me more than the world being full of those people is the house of God is full of those people. The church is full of those people that have yet to make up their mind. It's become a social event, and I'm thrilled about that. 
We need to high five, shake hands, hug necks, whatever your comfort level is right now. Uh, I don't live in the past. You're welcome to. It's up to you. But I'm not going to live in the past. We are moving forward. God is bigger. God is greater. And it don't matter to me what anybody else says because I really don't let that influence me anymore. I am sick of it. Is that okay? Sick of it. And so I don't talk about it. I, I don't lay around and think about it. I don't flip my blinds shut and be dis in despair about it. I grab the word of God, and we need to have a made-up mind concerning our job. We need to have a, when you get a job, you do all things as unto the Lord. Make up your mind. The unemployment rate is not at a, at a high peak right now because there's no jobs. It's because people don't want to work. They've made up their mind they want to get a free benefit, but they won't make up their mind they're going to roll out of bed at 4.30 in the morning and go do whatever it takes to provide for their family. You see, we need a made-up mind when it comes to our spouse. When I walked down, the, when Pastor Tammy walked down the aisle and I stood at the end of the aisle 30, almost 30, 32 plus years ago, uh, uh, 31 years ago, I believe in that moment that I made a promise to God, a covenant with God and with my wife. And before those witnesses, we exchanged vows, we exchanged rings, we made a covenant between ourselves and God, and we're going to honor that covenant. We need to have a made up mind. And let me help you with something, uh, spouses, real quick, real quick. Your worst enemy is comparison. Your worst enemy. I promise you the grass is not greener on the other side. When you get over there, you know what you're going to find out when the excitement's over? It's just grass. Hmm. Wow. What a way to start off the first four minutes. Right? And so we get a made-up mind concerning our kids that we have been loaned. We're all, their own loan. Their own loan. How are you going to raise them? We have commercials, and it, it drives me a little bit whew, off the end when those commercials come on with the dogs that's been found in and, and those dire, dire straits, uh, and, and we want your money for $25 a month. You could save little puppy here for $25 a month. You could save little kitty for $25 a month, but forget the fact that we're aborting 125,000 humans every single day. We need to, a made-up mind on the things of God. We have played and dilly-dallied and worried about offending people for so long now. Most pastors don't even know what to preach. They want to give you a feel-good message so you'll love them, hug their neck, and give a big old offering on Pastor Appreciation Day. Wow. Boy, am I in the right place. Wait, maybe you're saying... Am I in the right place? And so a made-up mind. I'm talking about a made-up mind with your job, your spouse, your kids, your friends. You need to make up your mind how you're going to walk this thing out, how you're going to live it. Make up your mind that you're going to heaven one day and you're not going to miss it. Make up your mind one day that this lifestyle and these friends and my kids and my spouse and my job have to line up with the Word of God. The Word of God has to be an influence in every aspect of your life to create a made-up mind that you're not tossed to and fro, that you're not led down every little path and every little road and leads to destruction. Scripture says narrow is the way. Nobody wants the narrow way. You know how I know? Because uh, the road to hell is wide, wide open. Huh. I think some of those writers, those songwriters knew that, didn't they? Now, nah, you probably didn't listen to rock and hump and roll music. You all have always been saved, sanctified, always done the right thing. But I'm wondering why the song has to say highway to hell and the other song only says a stairway to heaven. I think they figured it out. Now, if the church can figure it out, then I think we'll be in a whole different direction. I think we'll have a whole different mindset. Y'all still with me? We got to have a make, made up mind concerning our church. We have to have a made up mind concerning our church services. What I found is yesterday, believe this or not, yesterday, th this is like the day before today. Okay? Yesterday. Top numbers, air traffic was at the highest rate it's been in however long. Air traffic. 
Highways were completely packed. If you were in your house, take my word for it. The interstates were completely packed to the point 77 couldn't feed itself on the 81 corridor. And in turn, they were coming down 52. They were coming down 100. They were coming down any road they could get to get to the corridor. Yet when? Yesterday. Yesterday. No one was scared to fly. No one was scared to drive anywhere. Vacation destinations are at an all-time high this week, by the way. That's this week, same as yesterday. This week, right? No one's scared to vacate. The malls have been packed. Record sales at Lowe's ever since last March. Record sales at Walmart ever since last March. Lowest attendance in the house of God ever since last March. And so let me help you with something. This may be the time you hit that button, right? Exit, <laughs> right? Delete, unfriend, whatever that button looks like to you. It, it's your button, you know, it's your button. Do whatever that looks like, but we need to make up our mind. If we can run into the restaurants and there's a 45-minute wait, an hour and 45-minute wait, a two-hour and 15-minute wait at a restaurant yesterday, So you could go on vacation, you could fly across the country, you could run up and down the interstate, you could go to the restaurant, you could pack the malls, you could have record sales buying your stuff to do your yard work this morning. So don't tell me you're not in the house of God because you're scared. Don't tell me you're concerned about getting sick and not coming to the house. It's a lie from the end. Make up your mind. Don't talk out both sides of your face. Just tell me. I don't want to be there. I've made up my mind to stay out of church. God is no longer number one priority. Church is no longer at the top of my list. I've got things to do. I've enjoyed this new way of worship. That's not a new way of worship. Isn't it funny? We want the word of God that feeds us, don't we? And the one that clicks with us, the one that gets us the blessing and the prosperity. But what about the one that says, forsake not our assembling together? Those of you that aren't here this morning because of health reasons, I get it. Those of you that aren't here today because you don't have a way of travel, I get it. Those of you that live in another state and may not have a connection to a church, thank you, and I get it. But those of you that are able-bodied, able-bodied, a vehicle in the driveway, make up your mind. I think God's calling us to make up our mind in this hour. I think he's getting us ready for the greatest harvest at the church, the church, the church has ever seen. And I'm excited to be a part of it. And I hope you, I know you're ready for me to start preaching, but I'm almost finished with my opening. And so I look at that and I think about how we've made excuse and excuse and we call it the new way of worship. Can I help you with something? And I'm going to preach about this coming up. I've already got about 12 pages of notes that I need to make a little less than that. But that, that has nothing to do with the new way of worship. There's no discipline in that. There's no discipline in your walk with God right now. You watch it whenever you want to watch it. Grab it whenever you feel like grabbing it. If it, something don't bother you or catch your attention or uh, 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 drag you away at the moment, you know you can stop, come back later and watch it if you, you have time, right? So there's no discipline in that, and I promise you there's discipline in the house of God. There's discipline in your walk with God. If you have no discipline in your walk with God, then you're not walking with God. There's... I better get, I'm getting really serious now. So we think about concerning our walk with God. We're committed to sports, relationships, careers, right? Got to go to that vacation this year, have to, have to. I, matter of fact, I may go to four, four weeks vacation this year because I didn't get to do two weeks last year. Y'all still with me? I love y'all because I, I have to really. If I have to love you to tell you the truth, Right? And so we become aware that let's not get comfortable. Let me just give you that before I start my message. Let, let's stop this comfort zone business. Let's stop this I want to be comfortable. I like the fuzzy slippers sitting in my bed flipping the TV on. Pastor, I just wanted you to know we watched you on a 70-inch TV. I said, that is awesome. I had a, we all piled up in the bed, watched you on a 70. I said, that is awesome. I'm glad I couldn't see y'all piled up in that bed. Glad it's a one-way camera. Ain't you? 
I'm just saying. And so we look at that, and so we find ourselves, if we're not really careful, we'll find ourselves distracted from the things of God and not distracted by the things of God. I promise you, when I mention distractions, it's never that I'm distracted by the things of God. It's always that I'm distracted by the things outside the things of God. Our prayer before we came down, I just said, Lord, with all the distractions, use us today. Lord, with all the things going on, use us today. Anoint us today in spite all the distractions around this world and all the distractions in Withville, with County and in our families. And so we have to be really careful. The, my biggest fear isn't the concern of double-minded people in the world, but double-minded people in the house of God. The reason kids would be double-minded is because parents are double-minded, right? I would think, and I, let me just go ahead with this, I would think that the only reason a church would be double-minded is if the pastor... Were double, was double-minded. And so when I look at that, it, listen, this doesn't pull anyone out. This is everybody. This is me. This is anybody in this house. This is no season. There is no, this is not the season to get comfortable. This is the season. If God has called you and given you a talent, use it in the house of God. This is a season if God has called you to work with the kids and maybe sit in the nursery and rock babies or maybe whatever that role is. And Well, you know what? I'm really not good with kids. I don't sing. I'm not ever going to preach, but I do have a Colgate smile that's out of this world. If that's you, out here in this greeting area would be outstanding because everyone likes a Colgate smile. And maybe it's you in the parking lot. So I think about that. We're ready to get comfortable and let's let the, the, the workers work for me. And instead of looking for what God is doing, uh, we need to start looking for what God is wanting to do in us. And so the congregation, I believe, raises their tolerance when the pastor lives a life of simply raising his tolerance. When the church begins to raise their standards, you'll find leadership that has raised their standards. When a, when a home, when you see the kids coming up and honoring the things of God, they have raised their standard because mom and dad raised their standard. And, and so that there's a process here, and I'm going to get to a scripture in just a minute, but we're living in the most important time in history. And Christians, I can't speak to anyone else because I don't know what they've made up their mind about, but Christians need to make up their mind. Christians need to make up their mind that we're in. You need to, the church needs to make up their mind. Mom and dad needs to make up their mind. We need to make up our mind concerning the things of God. And we're going to look at James chapter 1. We've talked about James chapter 1 probably three times in the last six months. But in those three times, I read more scripture, and I'm just going to jump down to verse number 5, if that's okay, Kendra. I'm going to jump to verse number 5. It says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God, who gives it all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. And so when we lack wisdom, how many in here ever, don't raise your hand, how many of you just sometimes need wisdom? I, I need direction. And when Pastor Tammy and I pray before we come into this house, and usually any day of the week, we pray for him to guide us, give us direction. Lord, we don't want to come in here and patty cake. We, we, we're not looking for 350 or 500 best friends as much as that would be awesome in connection to what God's called us to, we'll take those, okay? Don't misunderstand me. But we need 350 or 500 people that we can give a word to that's going to change their life. And so more than anything, as much as we value your friendship more than that, we want to give you a word from God, period. And so we, when, when we seek wisdom, we should seek it from the Lord who gives liberally without reproach, and it will be given to him, verse number 6, but let him ask in faith without doubting. And so that happens a lot of times, doesn't it, in the season that we're in? We can talk about faith. We can sing about faith. We can uh, even preach about faith. But do we have any faith? And, and I'm wondering whenever you pray, whenever you ask God for something, do you really have faith? Have we settled into, hey, I just found out this week that I have cancer, but it's okay. Uh, God has a plan. I think that's noble. I, I think that's noble. But here's the thing about it. God is still a healer. And I can tell you one thing. God did not give you cancer. And I can tell you another thing. All good things come from the Lord, period. All good things come from God. And so when you begin to, when you get that report, you can settle yourself, absolutely settle yourself and know God's in control and God's got a plan. But his plan is to heal your body. His plan is to offer healing. You can bet that 20 years ago, over 20 years ago, 
When they told me I wouldn't live six months, I, well, God's got a plan. Absol- hey, kicking and screaming. Kicking and screaming. I was kicking the, the gates of hell. I was knocking on the doors of heaven. I was with whoever, whatever could hear me. I want them to hear me. Every demon in hell, I don't receive this. I'm not going to receive this. I will live and not die and declare the works of the Lord. I'm going to... De- when you think, uh, if we get enough word in us, I can tell you what, you won't settle for any of that mess. You get enough word in you and you understand who you are and the power he has. That one scripture became life to me. I will live and not die and declare the works of the Lord. I will live and not die and declare the works of the Lord. I will live and not die. And guess what, I, guess what God allowed me to live? You know what else he allowed me? To not die. Guess where my choice came in? To declare the works of the Lord. When God blesses you and delivers you and sets you free, it's not so you can come back and sit on your hands. It's not so you can tell people, yeah, I should have died 20 years ago, but it's for us to declare the works of the Lord. It's for you to get on the corner if you have to, and I, I don't recommend it, but if you have to, to get in these classrooms and tell these kids about your failures, these teenagers about your failures and how God brought you through. To get up in some kind of small group or get you some ladies together that's going through the exact same thing and say, let me tell you about God. We need to have a made up mind that if we're going to quote scripture, then let's walk it out. It bugs me when people quote scripture and they live like hell. It just bugs me. Does it make me mad? No, it don't make me mad. It bugs me. I'm thinking they ain't no more scripture than the majority of the people in church around the world and living like they're living. There's no power in that. You can quote scripture till Jesus comes if you want to. But if you don't have a relationship with him, all you're going to hear is depart from me. I never knew you. Let's look at verse number seven. I mean, verse number five again. It said, let him ask in faith without doubting. And he who doubts is like, look, 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 here it is. When, when we have two thoughts, when we have faith on one side and doubt on the other, what would we call that? Maybe double minded. When we don't have our mind made up, when we don't bring it into alignment with the word of God, look what happens. We're like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. That's what's happened to the church. Not this church, but all the rest of the church people y'all talk to, y'all, I mean, y'all know it happened to them. But not our church, right? And so we look at this thing and we say, God, help me, forgive me, forgive me. You know what I've found in every aspect of Scripture that I've read probably in the last year? That there's a moment for me to ask for me to repent. There's a moment for me to say, man, I, I'm sorry, Lord, for depending on me so much. I'm sorry, Lord, that my mind, my thoughts took over what you had for me. I'm sorry that what I had as an ambition was not a call of God and I went the wrong direction. I look at this and I say, Lord, forgive me that I had any doubt. And now I've been tossed and driven and tossed by the wind. And here I am out here hanging on the ledge and trying to figure out how to get back. And it all happened because I hadn't made up my mind. And so we make up our mind. It brings us back in off the ledge. But look what it says. And let not a man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man. If you think you're going to live like hell and get all his blessings... If you think you're going to study for a C and get an A. When I was in school, I studied for a D. What do I need to graduate? You need a good solid D. I said, you got it. Was it because I wasn't smart enough? Don't answer that. Let me answer that. I don't think it said I wasn't smart enough. I wasn't disciplined enough. I wasn't committed enough. I hadn't made up my mind to what I wanted to do in that. The only thing I'd made up my mind was I want to get out of here. Right? And so I'm the same way with this world. I've made up my mind. I want to get out of here. And when I do, and when I do, I want to hear well done, my good and faithful servant. And so it changes my perspective and it makes me have a made up mind and it says he is a double-minded man unstable in all his ways now true that he's talking about when we pray uh, we should pray by faith without doubting and we'll receive right but then he says if you do that or don't do that then you are double-minded and unstable in all your ways what ways all your ways 
You see, this thing doesn't just affect you. This affects your kids, your marriage, your relationships, your lifestyle. This affects it all. This is it right here. If you have faith, but you doubt, to me, sort of, you know, I'm not sure how that works, oil and water. And so I look at this and I'm thinking, look, we need a made up mind because a made up mind is a threat to the enemy. You just become, when you didn't have a made up mind, you were vulnerable to the enemy. Now that you've made up your mind, you're a threat to the enemy. You see, that's why he don't want you to make up your mind. That's why he wants to keep you in turmoil. That's why it's amazing to me how smart your migraines are. They only come on Sunday morning, late Saturday night. I've I've noticed that uh, sickness, uh, about any sickness right now, coronavirus was the smartest disease in, I guess, in history of the world. Because you couldn't get it at Lowe's or Walmart, but don't come to the house of God. I, I couldn't get it at work or going out to get me some ice cream, but I can't go to the house of God. Because that's the only place... And so I hear people and I get messages on Sunday mornings that says, pray for me. Man, this is happening and that's happening. And I said, how smart? How smart are our sicknesses? That Saturday night is the only night we couldn't sleep. Saturday night, early Sunday morning, the only time we have a migraine. The only time our bowels are loose. I guess I should have used diarrhea. (laughs) But isn't it crazy? And here's my made-up mind. There's four bathrooms in this building. And I'm just saying. And there's one next door. And I've made up my mind. If anyone's ever lived that, it's me. I lost 42 pounds in 29 days when they told me I wouldn't live six months. 42 pound in 29 days. When we went somewhere, and we went somewhere, we went to church every time the doors were open. And we were very strategic because I was so sick. We didn't go the quickest route. We went the route that had the most, the closest references to a restroom. I'm just being honest with you. We didn't stay home and sulk and cover our head up, put our head in the sand, and say, my God's not bigger than this sickness. We went to the house of God, and we said, whatever it takes to get there, five stops on the way in 12 miles, it didn't matter. We had a made-up mind that we didn't receive this report of the enemy, but we received the report of the Lord. And after I'm losing all that weight, I'm just going to be honest with you, it, it, it done a whole lot to me in a whole lot of ways. A whole lot of ways. But it made me more determined. It made me make up my mind. And I said, you know what, devil? You tried to kill me. And as long as there's breath in my body, if I have to preach to the dogs out in the yard, if I have to preach to the cattle in the field, if I have to preach to the horses on the hill, if I have to preach, I'm going to tell everybody about this God that delivered me and healed me and made me whole and made me a new creature and a new creation. And a made-up mind will not only be a threat to the enemy, but a made-up mind doesn't make excuses. A made-up mind doesn't make excuses. A made-up mind can accomplish great things. A made-up mind doesn't carry a spirit of offense. A made-up mind will stand. Joshua 24 and 15, one of my favorite scriptures to kick some daddies and some mamas right in the tail. This is the one, and it says, if it seems evil for, for you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. And here's, I'm going to add my footnote, and serve him. Choose that you're going to serve him on Sunday, but still serve him on Monday. Come on. You choose it on Sunday, still serve him on Tuesday. If you chose it, on, he's the same God on Thursday, the same God that you said yes to on Sunday, my lands. Can't you give him four days? Praise God. Am I in the right place? Whether the gods that your father served that were on the other side of the river, the gods of the Amorites or those uh, whose land they dwell, but as for me and my house. You see, dad and mom, this is where you and I have to make up our mind. This is where we make up our mind. I realize there's t-ball practice on Wednesday. 
I realize that. I realize they're going to have games on Sunday. I realize that. So who are you going to serve? Right? I told somebody a few years ago, and you know, I'm honestly, I've told y'all before, my mom used to answer the phone and call me, just answer and say, hello, brutally honest. And that was my name for about a year. And so I found that humorous, but at the same time, I liked it, you know. I said, that's okay, because one thing about it, everyone will know where we're at and where we stand on the things of God, and I'm good with that. And, and so I was talking to this person, well, you know, we signed them up for AAU, and we signed them up for this, and we're playing rec league, and we're going this, and we're going that, and we're going this, and going that. And so they went from a family that was uh, uh, with a foundation of the house of God, always in the house of God, grew up in the house of God, yada, 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 kids always in the house of God, to they never were in the house of God for about a span of 12 years. And I gave them a revelation long before that 12 years because unfortunately now none of the kids are in church. None of the kids want any part of it. None of the kids counted a priority because it wasn't a priority for their parents. None of the kids count living for God a priority because it wasn't, it seemed it wasn't a priority for the parents. And so we can get tore up about this and get mad at the pastor, but I'm okay. I'm, I'm, I found out a long time ago, I'm a pretty big boy, so... And so here's what I reminded this person when they came and said, I don't understand. I said, we had this conversation about eight years ago, four years in. We had this conversation, and I told you for sake of names, I won't use it, but I said, what did I say? Well, you said at best little Johnny might get to play through high school, but he wasn't going to be going to college anyway. That's what I said. You're not giving him a foundation of Christ and a foundation of God, and he's probably never going to get a scholarship. They're never going to get a scholarship. So what did we accomplish? We played for 12 years. And now we're several years into this thing, and none of the kids are in the house of God. Not only are none of the kids in the house of God, the man and woman are no longer married. You see, you can't tell me one thing and then do something else Say one thing and believe something else because you are double-minded. And when you are double-minded, you are unstable in, uh-huh, uh-huh. And it does affect your marriage. And it does affect your kids. And it does affect your job by the way they lost theirs. And it does affect relationships. And so when you look at this, Pastor, you've been on us since you started. I'm really not. I'm really not. I was telling a guy yesterday some things, or day before yesterday some things, he was talking about a topic, and I was telling him, and he's all the way, now you're scaring me. I said, no, I don't want to scare you. I just want to make you aware. We can make a good decision if we have all the information, right? And if I don't give you all the information, how can we expect you to make a good decision? And so we make up our mind right here, and I'm closing. You may say today, I'm ready, I'm, I'm ready for a made-up mind. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Now, listen, there's nothing wrong with playing sports. Don't anybody leave here and say that I've got it on record, right? And they're recording it, okay? But what I've found is that when enough men and women will stand for their kids and the things of God, guess what? They'll change that practice time on Wednesday. It happened when we were raising Montana. But that's, what, 30 years ago. 30 years ago, there were enough parents that we went before the people that mattered and the, all those parents said we will not be at practice on Wednesday that's church night we will not play any games on Sunday that's church day, family day and guess what happened At 30 years ago, don't misunderstand me 30 years ago, you know what happened we didn't have practice on Wednesday and they had no games on Sunday I'm just telling you it's a matter of what you want to stand for what you want to make up your mind for if you don't mind ruffling a little bit of water See, I don't mind rustling in a little water. That's one of the few times that I did it and still had people stand with me. Have you ever been in that meeting that everybody said, hey, you be the spokesman and you bring this up and you say this, we're behind you all the way. And boy, you get up and you say this and the boss looks at you like he's going to. And I say, now, we're all in agreement, right? And they go, That wasn't the case 30 years ago. There was a whole group of parents that said, listen, God first, period. That don't happen today. Why? 
because we didn't make up our mind. We're, we will very likely lose a generation if the church don't sharpen their pencil right now. If, if the church don't begin to sharpen their axe, it's very likely we'll lose a generation of, of them even knowing who God is because it's not a concern. If you don't believe me, watch the news. The very thing I've told you not to watch. James chapter 4, verse number 7, it says, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So there it is. So what's the potion? What's the cure? What's the magic? There's no magic. It's right here. Submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. How do I get a made-up mind? You submit yourself to God. You resist the devil. He will flee. Now he fleed on Sunday, leave him fleed on Thursday. Quit running back. We've got to make, listen to me. God has spoke to me. God has spoke to Pastor Tammy. There is going to be an influx. There is going to be a, a, a harvest coming on this hill. We can't run that by ourselves. We can't minister if we are full of double-minded people. We can't do what God called us to do if the house is full of double-minded people. That's just the facts. This is going to be one of the greatest things you'll ever do. Answer the call of God. Answer the call of salvation. Say, I'm tired of being double-minded. I'm ready to settle myself in the things of God. God is number one in my life. And let me help you with something. Church doesn't even have to be number two. God, we've had it all wrong a lot of times. I know people that won't darken the door of the church because their parents put church before them. That's not the process. God first, your family second, okay? But if God's first and your family second, then you're already teaching them about God outside this building and church is third. So don't misunderstand me today. But we need to have a set mind on the things of God. We need to have a made up mind on the things of God. Look at this. Draw near to God and he will draw near unto you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Wow. Why you preach about that? Because it's in the word. Why would you call me a sinner? Because scripture says in Romans that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And I'll be one of them. So when I'm reading this to myself, I say, cleanse myself, old sinner. Purify your heart, you double-minded. What's going to change your mind is a purified heart. When you set your heart on it, when you set your heart on it, listen, we can't go back and fix anything, so we pick up today, right this moment, and we say, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm not going to live double-minded. I'm going to have faith without doubting. God is going to be first. My family is going to be second, and the house of God is going to be third, and I promise you, if God is first and you want your family to succeed, the house of God will fall right in there. So we choose today, choose this day whom you will serve. Stand on your feet and let's close. God, we're thankful today, Lord, we love you. Lord, I know there's people in here that already have a made up mind. I know that beyond a shadow of a doubt. It could be 90% or it could be 10%. It could be 1% or it could be 99%. And God, I don't know, but there's a reason that this word came forth today and your word says that your word will not return void. And so Lord, whoever this message is for right now, just let it love on them right now. This wasn't condemnation. This wasn't a, a, a fear. This was a great message of awareness that we become mindful of the things of God and the call of God on our life and what He expects on our end for us to influence people for the kingdom of glory. So Lord, we praise you for every person and every family represented today, every mom, every dad, every child, or every teenager, whatever that looks like today. We love you today. And at whatever age we can grasp this message, if it's 10 years old or 12 years old or 18 years old or 100 years old, let us right now grab this word and we submit ourselves to God. We resist the devil and he will flee from us. We'll draw near unto you and you will draw near unto us. Cleanse our hands, O oh Lord. Cleanse our hands and forgive us for our double-mindedness. Lord, purify our heart today in Jesus name across this congregation do a work do a work Lord let us make up our mind and set our priorities on the things and the call of God 
with your heads bowed today. Maybe that's a little heavy for you. Maybe it was too much for you. But just for a moment, you got it and you said, I, I, you know what, I just need a relationship with Christ. And if that's you, just slip your hand up and say, I'm not saved, but I want to be. Man. And it's a simple prayer. Let's just do it again. Just ask him to forgive you. Say, Father, forgive me. Come into my life. Lord, forgive me for my shenanigans, if that's okay. And maybe there's folks here that maybe you just ask, your, ask the Lord in your heart. And maybe there's folks here that you've been saved for years, but man, you've sort of... You haven't backslid, but man, you're really close to the fence. And if that's you today, that you wanted to pray this prayer toward the end that said, Lord, I'm ready to draw near unto you. And if you'll draw near unto me, cleanse my hands, Lord. Forgive me for being double-minded, Lord. Forgive me. And you just do that. Just do that. Let's clean our hands this morning and let's purify our heart. In Jesus' name, Lord, I just come in agreement with every person. Courage, boldness. Lord, the call of God will be revealed to them in a mighty way. In Jesus' name, can somebody say amen? Amen. Listen, we love you. I'm going to ask you to give God a hand clap of praise. I know sometimes, I think I told you last week, I love to come in here and get everybody fired up, jumping up and down, all this stuff. But this is still that jumping up and down stuff. You can leave here and say, I'm, I'm leaving here. I'm no longer double-minded. We're going to conquer the things. We're going to conquer this, this area for the kingdom of heaven. And I, we need you to do it, right? And so we link hands, join arms, and make up our mind that from this day forward, we're going to walk as a unit for the glory of God. And we're going to love people, and we're going to win souls, and we are going to see a harvest like we've never seen for his glory. Amen. Tell somebody you love them. Y'all have a great day. Don't forget meet and greet. If you're a new person or a newer person or just want to know what we're about, come right over here with Miss Katie to the left, to my left and she'll show you around. God bless you.